Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and running such a wonderful conference here. It's, I mean, I'm very impressed with Singapore, although there is no time to do anything with all these lectures from 9 to 5, but maybe I'll find some time. What I want to talk about is these, uh, I mean, try to make observations about what happens with the Fourier transform in this uh, generalizations of Godemont Jacquet, which was taken up by uh, Engo after Braverman and Kajdan. And I want to make some comments about them, and I want to show up that you can really do the multiplicativity if the basic principles are there. I think Lafork has some formulation, but Lafork uses the gamma factors or root numbers as it's defining for your transform. So let me quickly, and I should also thank the Institute for doing this wonderful job, taking care of us. And let me just remind you, since there has been no other talk this week at least, what goes on Jacquet, that's basically, that's the first time we had a general expression of a L function for the standard representation of GLN, so G is GLN. And then we have M, MN. And then we have a representation pi irreducible, admissible. And then we take a Fourier, uh, we, we take a matrix coefficient of this. And then S is a complex number. And the, we have the zeta function, zeta of, and I take, of course, a function phi in CC infinity of mn of um, field is f. And then you, you look at the z of phi, f, and s. It's just the integral over gln of f of phi of g, f of g, determinant of g to the s, dg. This is the famous zeta function, which just generalizes states of uh, Godemont and Jacquet many, many years ago. And then they prove a functional equation. First of all, you need a Fourier transform. I remind you that this is just the integral over <coughs> of the function phi of phi, uh, psi of trace of xy, dy. And this is, of course, over mn of f. And this would be the Fourier transform of your function phi. And the zeta function satisfies this functional equation, n minus s, phi, check, and f check. f check, any function check means that the value of the function at x inverse. So, and then you have also the other one. And then there's a gamma factor here that is satisfied by this. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to write psi there, OK? Because I'm going to be carrying a lot of psi. So no psi will be seen. But of course, we all know that it does depend. But I have fixed, I mean, this is psi comes from here. And now, to generalize this, Brotherman and Kajdan had some ideas that go, took over after they did this uh, geometric way of looking at things. And they tried to generalize this to arbitrary group and arbitrary representation of the L group. And the first thing that you have to, the matrix coefficient stays. The first thing which is new is going to be, what is this? In fact, what is this? And for that, there is this notion of a monoid. So a monoid is a. <coughs> Let me define. A monoid is a, a affine algebraic variety with a associative multiplication, multiplication, and with an identity. So let me denote it by M and one in M. And then this is a definition of monoid. It clearly generalizes. This is, this is exactly like that. And then you have, you take the groups of, group of units. This is the group of units. So this is M star. 
and we denote this by G, and we will say the monoid is reductive if and only if G is reductive. Okay. And if G is semi-simple, the only possible monoid for it would be itself. So this, to this, working with this system, you always need to have some center. As you will see, you will need to have a group with center, like GLM. Now, the first thing is try to come up some way of relating monoids to, uh, to this whole theory here. So how do you relate a monoid to anything? I mean, you first of all, this is everything here is, here is the L function, so it's L standard that you are going to get. And the goal is to get it for any group and any representation of the L group. And of course, that's a big deal. So first of all, we want to, we have to somehow connect to M the representations. This is rep of LG. Rep of LG. And how do we do that? The way Wimberg started. And it's not going to be the way that we will need it. We will change it to the way Renner did it. So Winberg basically told you that if you have a if you have a monoid and you have G equal to G of M and G prime equal to G derived, then under the assumption that G prime, G over G prime is one dimensional, you can determine all the monoids of the of all the monoids whose group of units is this particular G. Uh, and the, not the, but the derived group of the group of units is this G prime by means of co-characters. So let me explain this a little bit more carefully. G prime is fixed. And then, of course, inside here you have the maximal torus. You have the center, and then you will look at T prime over Z prime. Let's call this, the, this is T of adjoint group. And let me take a co-character lambda from F star to here, or let me, I don't want to say F star, I want to say GM of GM to here. So these are co-characters. You will, if you choose your co-character to be dominant, meaning that the kappa of lambda and H alpha is being equal to zero for all alpha, all the positive roots alpha, if you assume that, then you will be able to pick up a monoid, and you will be able to, uh, to, he will tell you that with, with a given one, with this property, there exists a monoid M, uh, let's say M lambda. Now, what is the special thing about the M lambda is that inside here, you will have a, this is, I shouldn't say G lambda, but let me say G of M lambda. And then this, the derived group of this is exactly this fixed G prime. So G of M lambda will be derived with B G prime. And this is not going to be the group you will be integrating over if you're going to generalize this, if you want to generalize this. But there will be some group related to it. And that's the problem. So we, this, this construction of Winberg has this deficiency that your group changes as your lambda changes. And G prime is fixed. You get a monoid defined by that lambda. And the, the derived group is fixed. But the G itself changes. For example, if you want to get the symmetric square for GL2, then this some group, some reductive group is coming. That would be GL1 cross SL2. On the other one, for symmetric cube, your G lambda would be GL2. So the group itself sometimes appears, sometimes doesn't. So one way is that we want to, we want to uh, take care of this, that the group which comes in, which is attached through this, for a given lambda, the group that the monoid and the group that we get remains, the group itself remains the same. The monoid may change, but the units of that monoid remains the same. So all, I mean, this is really, this is, I'm not going to use this. This is just a point of the first steps of trying to understand this approach was through this ideas of Wimberg. Now, <clears throat> one thing which one has to really deal with, okay, assume somehow we found this monoid, then what replaces the Fourier transform? This is something that is quite, quite serious. Go has made 
a lot of progress in this, at least in some, some sense. And the <coughs> idea is to try to understand uh, the corresponding Fourier transform for any, for any representation of the L group and any group. Now, this lambda was dominant, so the representation of the group will be the, will be rho, rep of G prime, defined by lambda, and lambda is the highest weight of it, so lambda is highest weight of rho. So this monoid should be the monoid which gives you the L function attached to rho. Of course, the rho is a, is a representation of G prime. You have to fatten up to get a, to get a group G and use the representation of that. And as I said, that group G is not going to be your original G. It will change. All right. Now, with respect to the Fourier transform, let me just tell you one quick fact. The main thing that it should, a Fourier transform is given by a kernel. A Fourier transform is given by a kernel. So, for example, for the, for example, for this, the, the, for the case of GLN and the standard representation, the Fourier transform is just given by the psi of trace of G times determinant of G to the n times the R measure. And this is this is this is like a kernel here. And let me call this J of G. And if you come com, convolve this with the function, but with the value at the inverse of the function, I'm doing it over GLN, then this thing, this, this thing is going to give you the Fourier transform. So let me write this, J, this thing at X is going to be equal to determinant of X to the minus N times Fourier transform. This is just a convolution of this uh, kernel with the, with the function phi, or it's I check. Now, in general, if you want to produce a theory like that, you need to find the kernel J. And this would be your Fourier transform. You want to be able to do that. Now, one thing which is true in here, you can just see that J times some int of x, you know, let me write it as J of G x inverse G x is J of G. So this J is uh, int invariant. It's under the uh, conjugation by elements of G. Doesn't change. This is important. The Fourier transform that Go defines has this property. The Fourier transform that comes in to the Go de Monjacquet surely does have it. And then there is also the case of doubling, just uh, Piotrowski, Rallis, and and uh, Lapid and that does have two, but that we sort of didn't know until recently. I mean, that at least is not explicit. So this is very important that J must be int G invariant. <laughs> so this is at least like a, a background to what this game is. I think Go is going to probably tell us more this afternoon. Now, where does the where does multiplicativity come in? This so far, this was a hopes of having a theory of L function, which is very general. I don't know if in any other method that, except if you do the Katz Moody stuff and it works. I don't know of any other method that you can predict the future. This one does in some sense. It may not work. But the potential is there. And my interest to looking at these things in part came from this multiplicativity. I mean, there was this theory of, yes. Yes, you have to use Poisson summation. Of course, that's, a, that's also the hard part. Yes, there is a, there is an analog. Of course, you will define these over adults and you, you will have the, I mean, the Fourier transform for example, I mean, in, in some cases, the uh, functional equation of the Eisenstein series is like, a, is like a Poisson summation formula. So global thing would be a Poisson summation formula. Now, <coughs> the, 
the problem that uh, we were thinking, me and Jim Cogdell, and I'm sure a bunch of other people is, and Sai, my former student, is to show the equality, equality of gamma factors. Gamma factors, more or less from different methods, and of course the most basic one is for the artin factors versus the factors that are defined by the Eisenstein series the way I define them. And of course the techniques are general, you can apply it to ranking Selberg too. The same thing, the, the biggest thing is that you have to know the equality at arc medium places. So that's a, uh, that's a fact. And one of the major components in that is this multiplicativity. You need to know this. It's not enough, but this is the first step. And basically multiplicativity is how does this gamma function, which I think I erased, behaves under induction. How does gamma factor behave under induction. In the langlands shahidi method, this is just a simple fact concerning the fact that intertwining operator is a multiplicative object. So it becomes a product of rank one operators, and that implies that the local coefficients are, and then you have to do some work and show that the gamma factors are. In the ranking Selberg, this is usually pretty hard. That's the, right? That's usually, I mean, it's usually pretty hard. My hope was to see what happens in, in this case, and my interest to this method was that I had all these ideas and I really wanted to have a general theory of gamma factors. And the only way I can get something general is this. And then I can, of course, formulate, and I think I can prove a little proposition showing that if you have certain things, the multiplicativity follows. The best example of it is, of course, is GLN. And in the case of GLN, and if you are working with a full general representation of the L group, you will be dealing with the, with, with the sure functors, because there, that's the only way that you can really make things work, because sure functors behave very nicely. They, you start with a partition. You start with a partition. This gives you, of course, this partition of n or whatever, yeah, some integer. This gives you a representation of symmetric group. Symmetric group and a representation of the GLNC. And the highest weight of it is going to be given by this partition. And then <coughs> the nice thing is that then to this thing you can, you can define the so-called the sure functor. And the sure functor has the property that if you take two spaces and add them up, then you will have S lambda x on V and x s lambda acts. These are vector spaces. And then you will have a remainder. And the remainder, if, you, if this was symmetric square, would be symmetric square of v, symmetric square of w, and the remainder would be v tensor w. So that's, that's a representation. This is a rep of v w. And so this, this would be the first step when you are trying to prove, to, to study, fun, uh, to study multiplicativity. And then the question would be that if you take the gamma function, S, some representation, pi of some GLN1, C, I'm sorry. GNL1, F, GLN2, F, and then then the, some, this representation rho, which is given by this, rho is given by this partition lambda, then this you can show is equal to gamma of S induced representation from, this is the Levy MF P of F to GL N1 plus N2 of F and the same rho. So this is, of course, this you will write your you will write your thing as a sum of two things and row applies. So I'll, I'll explain this thing. So for the GLN, this is what you will be facing. If you want to prove anything general, you will be you will be have to you will have to deal with these these functors. 
And we, in, in the cases that we could do, there was these, these, there were these simple cases of symmetric powers or vexillar powers, and this formula was pretty elementary in that case. And now I want to see what happens in general. General in the sense of problem and cause non go and go. And so I want to have a, I want to first of all reformulate this story of mono. It's use a different method. Because if you realize when you define these gamma factors, this row is going to depend on your group. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, this, uh, the Fourier transform is going to depend on your group. Your monoid is going to go depend on your group. And if it is changes, it's no good. And you will see that we need to replace. So the goal is to, given a, given a group G and a representation rho of LG to GL of V rho, construct, construct a monoid M rho attached to this representation rho such that G is the G of this M rho. So G is fixed. Instead of remember that time we had G prime fixed. Now we want G fixed. And, and uh, rho is the representation. And then we want to, uh, and we want to construct this. And, and of course, G is dense inside M rho as an open subgroup of the units. And we want to build this in, we want to build this in a way that when I change my rho, G will not change. So, let me do this. I will, of course, assume G is split. And let me take rho and restrict it to L group of T. T is in maximal torus in here. Maximal torus in here. And I decompose this. And this is going to give me weights of the representation. So these are going to be weights, weights of rho. And then. Out of this, you can define the so-called, you can define, let me just take lambda to be home of gm to t. And then, of course, you take lambda r to be lambda tensor r. This is a linear space. And uh, let me take the cone generated by these weights. So these weights are going to be elements in here. And they generate, and let's, let me take omega to be convex cone generated by this, by the weights, <coughs> by the weights. For example, for symmetric square, if you take your, you will be in R2, this is E1, this is E2, and then you will have, this, this, I'm sorry, this is then you will have 2E1 and 2E2 and the weights, and then the other one will be E1 plus E2. Of course, we are assuming there is center. And we are assuming that center acts like a scalar. I'm assuming the representation rho. This rho is, is irreducible. Yes, this rho. But then I will allow it to be reducible as it, as it restricts. I'm assuming there is a center. Yeah, this G must have a center. Otherwise, Otherwise, you won't get this cone good enough to do anything. The cone is not going to be, I mean, strictly convex. I mean, the apex will be inside. So this will be, the, the, if the group G, as, I, as Jace mentioned, if the group G is, has a center, as a center, center means non-trivial center, then this cone is going to be in a shape. It will be the so-called strictly convex. And if you have a strictly convex cone, there is a theory which is very old, but very useful, called the theory of toric varieties. Out of that, you can at attach a, a, you can attach a variety mt in which t is dense with an embedding j. All right. So this would be an embedding of the torus inside mt, and then you can, out of this, build the build the monoid. So it is. Let me do this. So the cone which came, so we have weights. 
weights gave us that cone. Cone will give us a variety. So, weights gave us this cone, and cone gave us this toric variety. It's a good exercise to do it for symmetric square. Let's see what this variety looks like. And then <coughs> T will be embedded inside here. The characters of T, X of T, so if I take J, then there is a map from here, J star, the other way around from characters of MT, but those are, that's an affine variety, that's a monoid, MT to the characters of T. An image of this is exactly going to be the one which are dominant. So the image of, it's gonna be all the dominant. Character. So in, within the Winberg's case, that's why the dominance comes, and this is how you will build the how you will build the represent. I mean, the monoid which corresponds to that representation. How do we how do we make this? This is so we have this information. <coughs> the wild group of G acts on both of these. Wild group of G acts on. W, W of G and T, acts on T and T, X of T and X of MT. Then we're gonna choose for every element, lambda J or lambda I, dominant. Dominant, I can attach, I can attach a representation, so let me denote this by mu sub lambda, b sub lambda, let me call this just lambda. Rep of g on this space v lambda with the highest weight lambda. Highest weight lambda. And then you do this, you find, uh, if there's a finite number of elements that if you take w act and on these things, this thing, this set generates generates all of X of MT. So we will choose them, say let's call them, uh, these possibilities, let me call them lambda one all the way to lambda S. And then you will get for these things representations mu one all the way to mu S. And then you just add up, you will define mu to be equal to direct sum of these representations, all right? And then this will allow you to embed G, G then will embed inside the, and this is on the space V mu, this is direct sum of V mu I, V mu I, and then G will act on the endomorphisms of this, endomorphism of V mu, and therefore G embeds in here, and then you find, then G embeds in here, let me call this eta, and then you will find eta of G, and find its closure. This would be the monoid. So this is the monoid corresponding to rho, and rho is the one which is given by this face. With this face. This face. And what happens is that you start with your Group G, you don't lose the group, you will have it at the end. You find the weight of your representation, you find the toric variety NT, and you, the wild group acts on it, you do this construction, you find the minimal representatives, lambda one all the way to lambda S, you add up the representations, and then you, you get a representation, I mean, you get a, of course, reducible representation of G on this endomorphism of VMU, all of this in this space. This embeds in here, and the closure of it gives you a monoid, which is, which should be the monoid attached, the monoid that gives you that L function for representation row. So this is Renner's construction. Renner's construction. When I was mentioning this multiplicativity, you realize that you will end up have to, you will have to do 
deal with different representation. If the group was going to change by changing your monoid, then you would be in trouble. But the group stays the same with this construction, but not with the Winberg's construction. Now, <laughs> one nice thing about this construction is that it behaves very well with respect to the parabolic induction. It is not at all hard to show that it's just a restriction matter. So if you have a if you have a parabolic group, subgroup P of G, P of G, and then you can find a Levy decomposition for this equal to Ln, and this would be unique if L contains T. So if I look at the representation rho of the L group, well, G to GL of V rho, then I can restrict it to L. With the representation from Lm, again to GL of V rho, you decompose it like this. And this would be then a situation with M, and the nice thing is that you can show by just calculations that the monoid, the monoid M, let me call this rho L. M rho L determined by Renner for L and this rho L is the same is isomorphic to the image to the one to the image remember I call this thing mu to the mu of L mu of L bar and that's very easy by the definition that we make, that it doesn't matter how you, if you, I mean, you look at M as a reductive group, you can define Renner's, use Renner's construction and find this monoid. You can also take L and rho L, I mean, attach it, you can also take as L, L is a subgroup of G, find its image and takes its closure. The two monoids are the same. Now, now how does, where is multiplicativity in general that we have been talking about? <sighs> well, <sighs> we, have, we need a few things. And first, of, first of all, what are the space of functions that we have to work with? First of all, let me just define CC infinity of M rho just to be all the functions, functions of compact support, compact support in M rho of K, whose restriction, restriction to G, remember now G is inside here. G is open bands inside here, and it's the group of units of this guy. The station to G, L is Levy. But this is the monoid. M, I'm using M for monoid. Oh, you mean, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Let me, okay. Everything is split, so it, instead of all that, let me use L check. Then everything becomes easy. In M rho K, whose restriction to whose restriction to G of K is smooth, meaning locally constant. Let me define it like this, and then you can denote by S rho of G of K by definition to be M rho of K intersected. I mean, this. I'm sorry. This C C infinity. CC infinity of M rho intersected with G of K. And then you can do the same thing with L. The row of L of K to be CC infinity of M of rho L intersected with L of K. And you can show by just a little bit of small trivial arguments that this thing 
this thing is going to be, you can show that you can just take the functions in the ones on G and restrict it to M and you will get the other Schwartz functions. So these are replacements, I mean these are really the ones that you will be integrating against. So then you can really check that the, this thing is equal to S rho of GK intersected. So with that definition, everything, everything goes well. Now, so you have a space, you're, you're, given your representation rho through its weights, you came up with a, with a monoid and rho. The group G was the, was the uh, units inside it open and dense and contained there. And the, it, it, G will remain the same. You could change your rho, you will get other monoids, but G will remain the same. That's one thing that I wanted to point out. And then, of course, what about Fourier transforms? You would need to have a Fourier transform for rho, and you would need a Fourier transform for rho L. To make multiplicativity really go through, this, to, this, should be, this should be restriction of this. So you must expect that J rho of S rho L, this must be contained in the J in S rho L. Okay, so this, then under this assumption, you can, you can have, you can really define J rho L just to be the restriction. J rho restricted to S rho L. So you have your, you have your, uh, the two Fourier transforms, and these are of course, I mean, in principle, they're all conjectural, but I mean, you, yes. Restrict to smooth functions, whose restriction to G. Yeah, yeah. No, restriction. No, I mean this, you take, no, no, no. First of all, we define, so this is going to be the I love K. That's what I mean. You take the Schwartz functions of function on G. What? No, no, you're restricting. Restricting, I'm sorry. Okay? That's what you want. Okay, I'm sorry if I didn't. Now, so let's assume we have these Fourier transforms. They behave like this. And then I can define J rho L equal to the restriction of this. And then... <clears throat> and then we gonna we need to define the so-called Harshandra transform. So remember we had our P equal to L N and then we're gonna choose a function. We're going to choose a function phi in Schwartz functions of gk. I called it k, or if it is k, then it is really l. Is is f? K and f are the same. Did I use k? Yeah, k is the same as the local. I usually use k global f local, but all right. So phi would be in here, and you can define the following. Five P of L. You have to put a. You have to put. You need a determinant. I'm not going to talk about what it is. Things like this, and then this thing evaluated at L, and then the descent integral. So you're going to integrate over n of k the function phi m n d n. And this is really the Satake transform if you're in the setting of unramified groups and the torus, your, your parabolic being the Borel. Now then you can define
Then, yeah, this is this is called Harshandra transform. Then you can define <coughs> the gamma function. L. Oh, you know the fact that monoids are denoted by M is a headache. And you work with parabolics. It's, yeah, it's L. <laughs> now, then you t suppose I have a representation sigma rep of L of K. And then I induce from P of K, G of K, sigma tensor one, the standard thing, trivial on N. And then I look at the, I mean, I can define it. This is a representation, I can define a gamma factor for this thing that would be, and then with the representation row, so these are, these are the future, and these are the ones which, I mean, uh, should generalize Goldman your K, and you have this thing, and you also have gamma of S sigma and rho L. And multiplicativity means this. Means that these two guys are equal to each other. Okay. So you define with this representation and rho, and you define with the inducing representation and the restriction representation, these two factors should be equal. And let me say how, what is the proposition that one can prove. Let me write it in the other board. I mean, this, this gives us some idea about how the Fourier transform should behave under the, under the <coughs> induction, if any theory is going to hold. So the proposition is this. Assume that, assume the following. Assume that if I take J of rho L and apply it to the Fourier transform phi p of the sun. Now these are all in the, in the level of L. Assume this is the same uh, as if I take J rho, apply it to phi, and then take p here. So the Fourier transform and the, the Harishandra transform commute. Yes. Here, okay. Assume they do commute, and also don't forget J's must be J's are int G invariant. Invariant. If it J is, then J rho is also int L invariant, so it's, it's not a big deal. If this is true, then, then they, these gamma factors are equal. Then gamma of S induce, I'll just write it like, like this. Rho, you want a psi, I'll put a psi now. Gamma of S sigma rho L and psi. They are equal to each other. Under these assumptions that I made, this, you can prove this pretty much more or less like Goldman K. It works. And these things will come in. The proof is not long at all. But instead of that, let me just go and check it against what we know. The first thing is about the constructions of Go using Torais. As I told you, this is the simplest case of, a, I mean, when you have a unramified group and you have a Borel subgroup, and in the case of unramified representation, this is just a Taki. Isomorphism. What? Gamma is defined through a local functional equation. Using that, using that Fourier transform. Remember, I mean, you can, you can really, you can really look at the J of this thing, the, the kernel of the Fourier transform, and you can look at that times the F matrix coefficient. Let's, let's put S in here. This thing, by Schur's lemma, is going to give you some scalar times Fs. It's basically that's what it is. That's how you get the gamma. Now, so let me assume I'm in the unramified setting. So first, 
cases that goes poison po you have i mean these are these are this f is the matrix coefficient of pi these are f matrix coefficients of pi so it's f times determinant to the so these are matrix coefficients j your fourier transform applies kernel of it applies and gives you this okay now the, the first case is when you have the, let me take, draw this commutative diagram. Well, if I take Hecke algebra of G with KG and then go through the Sataki to Hecke algebra of T. I don't know what and T of OK, and that's G of OK. These are unramified, that's G of OK. And then, of course, in here, go defines the Fourier transform, so this would be J sub upper T, so this would be the kernel of the Fourier transform, again, going to here. And then, he has this conjectural for your transform J rho, so this is, let me just write it J. Write it J, and then this goes to, these are all depending on rho. And then this again goes to itself. And then this is again Sataki. He basically shows that this thing commutes, and that's how he can define J on the whole thing because he can Using this commutativity, he can define, he defines it on the level of toroids. And he does it for all the toroids. And all the toroids represent all the semi simple conjugacy classes, so by density, you will get the whole thing. So that's how he defines his Fourier transform. And this agrees with it. This, this thing agrees with it. Now, the other case that one can check is, of course, the case of GLN. I mean, verifying this, verifying this, condi this condition, yeah, verifying this in the case of GLN is a nice exercise. You can verify this for the, for the Golden Manjo K. In the case of the PS Radis, PS Radis Lapid, in this case, there is some work, but you can again, you will see there are some lemmas that they really show that this thing is true. So in the GLN standard, of course. I wish it was better than that. No, GLN standard. But this is, of course, classical group standards. And again, this whole theory says that you shouldn't be looking at classical group G. You should be looking at G times GM. You should have a reductive group. And that's what happens. That's when they do their work. It's, they are integrated. They are really doing L of S standard tensor chi. And that's why, because the group you will be working with is not going to be equal to, is not going to be equal to G of K SP, SP2N of K. It will be SP2N of K times GL1. <coughs> and so in these two cases, you have it, it agrees with these, and the uh, I don't have time to say much about the proof, but you can just start with the matrix coefficient for this. The matrix coefficient here is you take a function, a function in here and a function in here, and you take the V of G, let me just write the, the matrix coefficient is going to be V of KG, Let me, let me do it here. So I'll take V, and then I'm going to do V of KG times V tilde of K, DK over K. This gives you the matrix coefficient. So this gives you matrix coefficient, matrix coefficient for the induced representation. Then you plug it in in the zeta function and do calculations and use, and you eventually have to. When you, when you do 
you have z of phi and f, and that eventually is going to be equal to, let me write it, this is some notation of theirs. You take the, uh, the Harish-Chandra transform of this, evaluate it at your L, and then you have the matrix coefficient V of H, V tilde of K, and then the H, the K integral here. Still, you have a state, and this will be over. You also need an N L. I mean, I'm, I'm skipping one step, but this is what you will end up getting. And then this will be your Z, and then you will do something for feed check. You have to use the facts that these, these kernels that give you the Fourier transform are in G invariant, and then, of course, in the level of L intel invariant. And together with this, you will see that the gamma will be equal. Okay, this is, this, this is a, it's not hard to do this. But the thing is that at least we have some idea what the Fourier transform should, how it should be doing with respect to induction, and what will come out if you make the right assumptions, and hopefully produce them for cases. For the cases that we know, this is all true. But there are not so many cases we know. I think these are still the two cases that we know. I think I'm one minute late, sorry. Which one? You mean this this thing? <coughs> I probably <coughs> 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 I think it does. <clears throat> Let's first prove the multiplicativity, uh -huh. which we have proved if you, I think it does. Uh -huh. Look, I mean, if there is a theory of general theory of common factors, it has to be this, unless you have functoriality. If you have functoriality, then everything is a GLM. But if you don't, this is it. This is the only method of doing it. And if you do this, then you will get functoriality. Because you have a theory of L function and you use converse terms. This is, the, this is basically what is in no in, in go. What is it? Yeah, yeah, this, this, this is, yeah, I mean, he, <clears throat> he defines it by defining it on the Torahs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, I mean, the, <clears throat> agrees with his conjecture. Yes. You mean the cases of this thing? Is the Gaudi Monja K and the doubling? Doubling, uh, not the new doubling yet. You know, the doubling that I think uh, uh, Friedberg and Kai and uh, Kaplan did is more in the, in the uh, Jacques Schalaika approach. It's really like the Whitaker functions. If you notice, because they have integration over the unipotent radicals. So it is more in that spirit. This thing, this approach doesn't allow it. I mean, I try to put it in, in the Fourier transform. It doesn't work. So that's in spirit much closer to Jacques uh, like generic theory. And that's why they did it, because they couldn't, I mean, you couldn't extend this in that way. Yes, that in the different cases. I mean, in the case of doubling, of course, you use those instances. Well, I mean, you are supposed to have. I mean, they give you. You are supposed to have a Poisson summation formula, and one way of getting it is through Eisenstein series. They don't give you anything general. They're all conjectures. I mean, Langlands functoriality is all conjectures too. So that's the. Thank you.